Hi everyone. We have been talking about conversion therapy. Why is it problematic? Where did it come from? How would you recognize it and explain it if somebody was teaching all of those principles and ideas, but was disavowing conversion therapy? So if it was walk like a duck, talk like a duck, but says it's not conversion therapy, how would you know? So we've been talking about all of those things and also where it came from. So this video is really about the like patient zero of conversion therapy. What is the origins of it in its first stages? And it's our last video. And I think you'll find it really interesting to connect all the dots and see, you know, all these conservative Christians today, which obviously most conservative Christians aren't even subscribing to that. But, but those who do subscribe to conversion therapy still would call themselves Christians and conservative Christians. But are the origins in line with their values as Christians? And are they in line with your personal values, whether you are Christian or not? I think you'll find this video um, pretty interesting. And we begin with psychoanalysis. Now I get to talk to you about an organization I absolutely love, Seventh-day Adventist Kinship International. They're especially focused on Adventists, people of Adventist heritage, or who are connected to Adventists and who are either allies or LGBTQ people themselves. They're an affirming organization and they have meant the world to me. When I was first coming out, it was a really difficult time and they were absolutely there for me. People from the organization talked to me. I'm a member, which gives me access to all kinds of social media groups. I watch their YouTube channels, the resources on their website. It's a fantastic organization. I suggest you check them out. Link in the show notes. Just as psychoanalysts were saying, hey, this stuff doesn't work after decades of trying it, it was picked up and adopted by Christians, kind of baptized and turned into Christian cures for homosexuality. The person who really pioneered this effort is someone called Elizabeth Moberly. Uh, she wrote this book. It's a thin little book and it is basically psychoanalytic theory. So it's pretty dense. And um, if you've ever read psychoanalytic theory, which probably you have it, it's, it's right in the same lines. But this isn't at all vague. She says directly where her ideas came from, that she adapted them from psychoanalysis. It, this is not a secret. And in fact, Elizabeth Moberly did not actually even treat or act as a counselor. She developed these theories, but she didn't so much use and implement them. But they were picked up very rapidly by Joseph Nicolosi, who really took credit for the ideas largely. And Elizabeth Moberly kind of left the scene because she didn't want to fight with him over her theories and her ideas. But I mean, if you ask me, she kind of ultimately won. The kinds of things she advocates for in this book that she says came from psychoanalysis are exactly the kinds of ideas that are shared in this book, Coming Out of Homosexuality, and in the narratives that are told by Wayne Blakely, Michael Carducci, and the other one, Ron Woosley. <laughs> They're exactly the same ideas that are all shared. They come from psychoanalysis. So where did psychoanalysis get the ideas? Charles Socarides is one of the main proponents. And if you look at kind of the heyday of this type of reparative therapy, you're really looking at the 60s and before. And these theories all were grounded in the same assumption. And that assumption was that your sense of sexual attraction is something that is developed in childhood and it has to do with your relationships with your parents, your same sex and your other sex parents. And that's where we get our sense of sexual, sexual desire is from that. And those ideas can be traced directly back to a name you are definitely familiar with. And that is Sigmund Freud. So these ideas, they didn't come from the Bible. They didn't come from research. They didn't come because people were sitting and just reflecting on their stories in a non-biased way. They came through a, a system of belief and understanding that originated in these assumptions. Now, where did Freud get these assumptions? Let's think for a moment about 
Sigmund Freud. I, I learned this. I remember learning this in, in graduate school and it just like blew my mind. Putting Freud in context, Freud was a Jewish man in Germany right before World War II. He lived through the rise of Nazism. And we think of him maybe as being someone who was privileged, but he was not. He had a lot of proximity to people who had a lot of power and influence and wealth. And he was treating their family members in psychoanalysis. But he himself was in a rather vulnerable position. And people theorize now that what was happening is these powerful German, probably Christian, men were bringing their daughters to Freud for analysis to fix them because, you know, women, if you know much about the history of mental illness, you know that it was pretty much women who were considered mentally ill early on. But so he was bringing these, they were bringing these women to Freud. And it is very likely, actually, that a large proportion of these daughters had been sexually abused by their fathers. And if you think about Freud's theories they really fit nicely with justifying the sexual abuse of children. It is deeply disturbing. The Oedipal complex is in essence, the idea that a child's greatest desire is a sexual relationship with their opposite sex parent and that they are jealous of their same sex parent because they have that sexual relationship with their opposite sex parent. He established these ideas so firmly in the field of psychiatry that it took many, many decades before these ideas were rooted out. And the truth is that they have no, no real evidence and there's no way to disprove them. They're dogmatic in the sense that they're self-referential. They're too flexible. Everything can be explained away with so much of these theories. And this is exactly what we find in coming out ministries. I mean, and, and in all kinds of reparative and conversion therapy, anything will do, anything works as fodder for an explanation of why you became gay. Just think, think of anything bad that ever happened in your life. Anything bad. It could be a sexual assault. It could be uh, abuse by a parent, or it could just be that a parent was gone at a time when you really wanted there, then there. Uh, these books say that it could be real or it can be imagined. It, it doesn't even have to be real. All of these things, anybody, everybody has some hiccups with their parent at some point in time. So there's no way to confirm or deny this. And all these ideas originated from Freud. It's a straight line from Freud to Charles Socarides to Elizabeth Moberly to Exodus International to Coming Out Ministries and all these other ministries that say they aren't doing conversion therapy, but that's exactly where conversion therapy came from. This next clip is super cool because a friend of mine actually asked Michael Carducci exactly this question about Freud and let's hear what he has to say. Coming Out Ministries refers to broken relationships with the same gender parent as a contributing factor in becoming gay. This theory was established by Freud in the 19th century as a branch of psychoanal psychoanalytic theory. This theory has been debunked. So why does Coming Out Ministries continue to teach or at least insinuate this unscientific, unbiblical idea? Great, I think I already addressed that. Didn't I just say a perfect parent with a perfect family and still Lucifer chose to sin? And that's my answer to that question. Okay. But I do believe that there are uh, perceived, what is it, uh, your perception is your reality? Have your Okay, so this is exactly the kind of thing that are in these books. This is, they say the same thing. You heard that? And <clears throat> my perception was that my father didn't love me. My perception was that my father rejected me. You know, part of the issue was the fact that in his work, he was gone for six months at a time. You know, my dad did love me, but he was a hot-headed Italian and he was very emotional, so. It's just too flexible. His, his dad traveled for work six months at a time and had a temper, so he became gay. It's just, everybody can find a narrative. I perceived that as rejection and I didn't want to anything to do with that. 
those were things that I didn't put into motion. Those were things that did happen. I can't deny my experience. And yet there are plenty of people that say, you know, well, you know, uh, this kid came from a perfect family and he still turned out to be gay. Okay, well, guess what? There's still perceived or, or perceptions. I just don't understand how that actually defends his position and makes it stronger. So, you know, no offense to Freud, I don't know that I buy his stuff either. And, and if I happen to, uh, if, if, if my situation happens to, you know, support what he said, that's only a coincidence. I hope that you've been paying attention. It is not a coincidence. You know, I don't promote Freud. I do know what my experience was. And through some psychology and through science, I do recognize that there were some things that happened between my father and me where I rejected masculinity and I went to my mother's femininity. When he says psychology, he is referring to Charles Saccharides and Elizabeth Moverly and Nick, Joseph Nicolosi. All these names are like hard. <laughs> that's what he's referring to, which is conversion therapy. Absolutely, that's what it is. That is my reality and that is my truth. I can't deny it, whether it agrees with Freud or whether it's been debunked or not. But there's a lot of science that's been debunked because there is a political agenda that is being pushed and pursued. And you know what? If they'll take responsibility for that, I probably would be more likely to address their, their concerns. Does that make sense? Is that offensive to anyone? I... I'm trying to find a compassionate place from which to respond to this comment while also saying what needs to be said. Michael Carducci has experienced awful rejection in his life, sexual addiction, all kinds of the worst impact of the bigotry that society has on gay people. You know, he's talked about his sexual addiction. He's talked about all these things. But what he doesn't talk about is the impact of societal rejection and stigma on his own life, that kind of systematic assessment. And when he says, I can't deny my own story, what can I do? This is more than just his own story. Look here at their website. They hold themselves up as inspiring examples of what God can do to change people's lives. They use the principles of psychology and Freud. He does in fact agree with Freud. He has all the same assumptions that Freud has. These ideas did not come from the Bible. They didn't come from Christianity or Judaism for that matter. <laughs> they didn't come from science. <laughs> they didn't come from gay people sitting around and just objectively trying to understand their stories. They came from people trying to understand their stories in the lens of these assumptions that their sexuality was caused by all the worst things that have ever happened to them in their lives. And what is the result of all this? Let's see what Michael has to say. Do you see a problem with that? What's the problem? Well, not just that, but gay Christians should try to become straight. I, I can't control that. And, and you know, so what... Okay, so the. Okay, I want you to notice what just happened here in case you missed it. Michael is saying, I can't control this. I can't make myself straight. This is an honest acknowledgement. This man has given up so much to do what he believes God wants him to do. He has chosen celibacy, he's denied his internal sense of desire to form a family with another man. He's given all of that up. He's been incredibly vulnerable talking about his struggles. And this woman right here in the congregation, when he just admits, I can't make myself straight, objects to that statement and says, but aren't you denying the power of God? And this is the kind of pressure and stress that somebody like Michael Carducci is living under on a daily basis as he tries to find acceptance and a place within the Seventh-day Adventist church. It is incredibly frustrating and incredibly challenging. And this is what gives me a lot of compassion, 
even though I have such strong disagreements and I really have some major problems with what he's saying. And I don't know if he's being intentionally dishonest. I doubt it, but he's certainly incorrect. They are teaching XK stuff. Absolutely. Let's watch the rest of the clip. The thing is, is that I want to live a life according to God's will. And I can't help the thoughts that come in my head. And I surrender them. And I'm in the process of when those thoughts come in, I surrender them to God. And I do have heterosexual attraction, but not all the time. And so I still choose to live celibate. And as long as I'm living a celibate life and I'm not indulging in pornography, masturbation, premarital sex, or, or homosexual sex, I, I'm okay. And you know, for as long as, whatever it takes, if God wants to hit me with that magic wand, great. Go ahead, God, I give you permission. I want to explain something about the nature of trauma and the nature of mental illness. Because as we've talked about, there are some assumptions in here and the idea that your trauma, that your pain, that your rejection in childhood caused you to be gay is this kind of assumption that being gay is kind of a mental illness. When someone experiences trauma, it is an intense experience that often involves fear of loss of life or a physical assault or a sexual assault or something like this. There is a strong power dynamic involved. And oftentimes people who experience this kind of trauma have a few different things that they carry into their lives. And this is called PTSD. PTSD can manifest in a reliving of the experience you, you kind of can't think of what you thought for breakfast, but you can thought for breakfast, what you ate for breakfast, but you can recall in detail everything that happened to you in the trauma. Or maybe you forget about the trauma completely. It, it takes over your brain in one way or another. You could be preoccupied with it or you can be numb to it and not allow yourself to experience it at all but it dampens and numbs the rest of your experience of life. People who experience this can become highly activated and highly nervous. They can also sometimes, particularly in the case of sexual assault because of the shame involved in sexual assault, they can go the direction of developing an addiction to sex because one way to overcome or to seem to overcome shame is to say, you're going to try to shame me for that? Well, I am just going to go all in on that behavior. And I am going to show you that I'm not ashamed of it. You know, if, if I'm ashamed for having sex, I'm going to have so much sex that you'll never think I'm ashamed of it. And I'll never think I'm ashamed of it. And the other direction is just like totally shutting down and not experiencing your sexuality in a healthy way at all. It's running away from it. These are the ways that trauma manifests itself in your life. None of this is sexual orientation. The capacity and the ability to fall in love, to experience sexuality in ways that, you know, can be very healthy. Of course, they can be unhealthy too, just like straight people. But the capacity for connection romantically and sexually is not a mental illness. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about sexual orientation. So the idea that your sexual orientation is a result of your trauma and all the horrible things that have happened to you in your life, it sneaks in this assumption about what homosexuality is, about what being gay or bisexual or transgender is. And that is assumption is that it's an essentially disordered thing the way that trauma is. This is not what we see when we look at gay people, at lesbian people, at bisexual people, at transgender people. We are just as capable of being healthy, well-adjusted human beings as anyone else in the population. Our difficulties are the stigma and the rejection that we experience from our churches and our families. Those are the difficulties. Not because there's something wrong with our sexuality, but because people think that there is. So there's a fundamental flaw just kind of at the core of these ideas and these things that these people are teaching that needs to be exposed. So what is all of this 
accomplishing for a guy like Michael Carducci, who, frankly, I am grateful, admits that he has not become straight, who is living a celibate life. What does this accomplish for them? You know, Elizabeth Moberly quite boldly claimed that if you resolved those childhood issues and that gender stuff, that the that the homosexuality would just naturally resolve and the person would become straight. This is what Charles Saccharides taught as well. That's not true. We, we know now that that's not true. Michael Carducci knows now that that's not true. Um, Exodus International kept teaching those ideas though, and so does Michael Carducci and Coming Out Ministries. So if they're not making people straight, what are they, what are they doing? And I think this is kind of the dark side about the fact that they don't really advocate for people getting therapeutic treatment, is that it is accomplishing something for them. One of the most difficult things for me about being in the closet, even more difficult than not dating women, <laughs> you can believe it, was trying to convince myself that my capacity for love, my desire for family, was so sinful it could not be redeemed, was just beyond repair that it was that bad. Because there was just, no, I haven't, I haven't experienced anything. I had an, obviously not a perfect childhood. I, I, I'm sure I could come up with an next gay narrative if I really had to, but it would be some work. Um, but this idea that my sexuality was so broken that it just had to be pushed down. That was honestly the hardest thing for me to accept because I knew in one of those ways that like, you know, Jeremiah 31, one of my favorite Bible verses in the world that says, speaking to the Israel, the nation of Israel, I will write the law on your hearts. I will write the law on your hearts. You know, Jesus talks about having hearts that are soft to one another. Ezekiel talks about receiving a heart of flesh. I tried to write this law on my heart that it was sinful and wrong and irredeemable for me to be attracted to women. I tried with everything I knew with prayer as well. This was not a process from which God was excluded and my heart would not receive the message. It simply would not receive the message. If I believed that those desires were a result of all the worst things that had ever happened to me, especially if I'd had some truly horrible and awful and traumatic things happen to me, it would be easier for me to hate my sexuality. It would be easier for me to convince myself that it was broken and awful and dirty and disgusting and irredeemable. And if I believed that about it, it would be easy to be celibate or to not date women. But would it be good? And would it be right? And would it be true? I think we've seen, as we've traced this idea, these ideas that they did not come from God and that they're not holy ideas and they're not they're not healthy ideas. I don't, I don't care if you're using a psychological model or a spiritual model. These are shame-based ideas. And they're a problem. And what they're accomplishing for people is not the living water and life everlasting. <laughs> and that's why my heart goes out to especially people who have had these kinds of horrible, horrible experiences and think that that in some way is connected with them being gay. And I just think that the truth is a lot more hopeful than that. I think it is. And I hope you don't support these ideas from some of these ministries, whether it's coming out ministries or one of the other ministries that's still teaching reparative therapy, which I think if you've watched these three videos, you definitely have the skills to recognize now. So thank you for listening to my video. Please share this with the people who need to hear it because people need to hear it. 
and we've got more topics coming up for you as well. I want to talk about how some of these ministries actively spread stigma and cause problems within the church. And we're also going to get pretty soon into some more theological and biblical issues because that is a big part of what I do. So please hit that subscribe button and follow me. Check out my future videos. I'm very happy to have you. And just remember, when you don't have all the answers, God is not waiting for you to mess up. God's acceptance and love of you is not contingent on you having it all figured out. God loves you. It's going to be okay. Have a great day.